Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Ask a Reporter Anything webinar. This is an opportunity for scientists to hear directly from reporters about what day-to-day -day journalism is really like, uh, what their typical days are like, and the professional expectations and challenges that reporters face when covering science-related issues. Importantly, they'll also be taking your questions. My name is Meredith Drosbeck, and I'm going to be your moderator for the discussion. I'm excited to have been invited here by Boston University's Marketing and Communications Department and BU's Office of Research to facilitate today's event. Um, I wanna welcome BU faculty from across its campuses. Today's event is part of the Boston University Strategic Communication Series, which helps faculty members, researchers, and members of the BU community communicate their work and their expertise in effective, compelling, and accessible ways. I serve as the Deputy Director for Science at Sciline, a program based at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, whose sole purpose is to help get more science into news stories. In my role as Deputy Director, I work with a team of other scientists who liaise with the scientific community every day, reaching out to invite subject matter experts to talk with reporters, serve as speakers on media briefings, provide video quotes on breaking news, and offer other opportunities to participate in the news ecosystem. I'm a former scientist myself. I did my PhD in astrophysics, and after stints in research and in science policy, I joined Sciline in 2017 when we started. I didn't know much about the news business at the time. I read a lot of news, but didn't really think about how it was created. And so I spent the last nearly five years learning about the industry, about its norms, its needs, and its challenges. And I'm excited that you have the opportunity to do the same today by hearing directly from some reporters. So before we turn to our esteemed panelists, I wanna set the stage for our conversation by giving you some brief background. So if you bear with me, I'm gonna share my screen for a moment and dive in. I'm basing my remarks this, this afternoon on data from a variety of surveys and analyses done by the Pew Research Center. The last decade has brought significant changes to the US media landscape. This bar chart shows that in 2008, roughly 114,000 people worked in US newsrooms. That includes reporters, editors, photographers, videographers at newspapers, radio and TV stations, cable news and on digital platforms. By 2020, the bar on the far right, that number had dropped to 85,000, a loss of more than one quarter of those staff. This is according to data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And there are a number of complicating reasons for this trend, though one of the major contributors is the revenue loss from the shift from printed to digital platforms. We can dig into these data just a little bit and see how the changes have impacted different news sectors. This bar chart shows the percentage of total newsroom employees by industry at three points in time. 2008 is on the left, 2014 in the middle, and 2020 on the right. Overall, in that 12-year span, newsroom employment has plummeted at US newspapers, shown in the dark maroon at the bottom of each bar, while it's increased in the digital publishing sector, that tan part right at the top. Newspapers, which once employed 62%, of all news professionals in 2008, now only account for 36% of staff in the news sector. Broadcast TV has increased its share of news employees, though in raw numbers, their employment actually hasn't changed significantly. By maintaining their employment level while others fell, TV news now reflects a larger fraction of the total these days. In contrast, radio broadcasters have maintained a constant percentage of employees in the news sector, but that actually reflects a decline in the real number of people working in radio stations. So most of the gains in newsroom staff over the last 12 years have come in that digital news sector, where employment has more than doubled in that time. But even though the total number of people reporting the news in this country has declined significantly, that doesn't mean there's been less news to report, nor that news has been happening more slowly. Many places simply have fewer reporters trying to cover just as much news even faster. Some reporters now face the responsibility for reporting and publishing multiple stories per day, every single day. 
When we as scientists think about science news, we often think about specialty news outlets like National Geographic or Scientific American or big national media like the Washington Post or NPR, all of whom will report new research results and tell stories of how unique scientific discoveries happen. But science can be particularly relevant at the local level too. For example, how local industries such as a chemical plant might affect your air quality or city, county, or state plans for tracking continuing on break, out, outbreaks of the ongoing COVID pandemic. That's why it can be so important for scientists to be willing to share their expertise with reporters and especially with local reporters. The stories they're producing are the ones that will directly affect you and your communities and your voice can play an important role. In the middle of 2021, Pew released some new survey data on what Americans look for to decide whether a news story is trustworthy. And here you can see that the percentage of respondents in that survey who said it was very important to consider qualities like the news organization that publishes it, the sources cited in it, their gut instinct about it, the person, if any, who shared the story with them, and the specific journalist who reported it. That same survey showed variations in these responses by political affiliation, but overall, more than 20% of those surveyed said they pay very close attention to sources in a story. Another 45% said they pay somewhat close attention. And so if a journalist reporting on stories either about science or for which science can play an important role, such as a chemical spill that might pollute your local waterway, it's not just the ability of scientists to explain complex and nuanced issues that's an asset to the reporter. As a source of that story, readers and viewers are paying attention to you and you bring your credibility as a scientist with the public overall. So how can you be a part of this news ecosystem? What do you need to know about the process to decide whether to serve as a source for a reporter and how can you be great at it? That's what we're here to learn. One bit of housekeeping before we get started. Please feel free to put any questions that you have for our panelists in the chat at any time. We'll be collecting those and I'll read as many aloud for our reporters as I can in the limited time that we have. Our panelists today are three reporters who come from different types of news outlets and bring unique experiences and perspectives. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves as we get started. I'll simply say that we have with us Peter Prangeman, the Global Climate and Environmental News Director at the Associated Press, Claire Caulfields, a freelance podcast producer and audio reporter, and Lena Sun, a health reporter at the Washington Post. So Peter, I'm gonna to turn to you first and let you give a brief introduction. All righty, well, thank you. And, and thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, it's fun to be with you all. We were joking before we started that, uh, you know, as, as reporters and journalists, we're used to asking the questions, not getting asked. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to your questions. Um, I've been with the AP for 20 years in various locations around the world. Um, I've been a state house reporter, an immigration beat reporter, a video journalist, a, a foreign correspondent in, in several countries in Latin America, um, and a regional editor in the Western US. And, and now I'm, you know, the, the climate and environmental news director. Um, I, I mentioned sort of that breadth of, of experience because I, I really feel like I and the team that, that I'm building approach climate and environmental stories as generalists, but with real deep expertise in, in certain areas. Um, I, I feel pretty strongly that we really have to make stories accessible to readers. They can't be all doom and gloom. They shouldn't be filled you know, with a lot of technical jargon. And, and of course, they just can't be infused with an agenda. That's just, that's not our job. Um, historically, I'll, I'll tell you that AP covered climate change and environmental stories all under the health and science department. Um, what we've done now and what, what I'm leading is break out climate and environment to be its own department. And, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but the central one is really that climate change and environmental stories are not just health and science stories. I mean, of course, science is at the core of, of climate change and you know, what we have to look at. But there are also you know, stories about people, energy stories, innovation stories, business stories, political stories, lifestyle stories, et cetera. So, uh, and we're trying to encompass all of that in, in the thing that we cover. We're currently a team of 13 people uh, around the world. And by the end of the year, we will be 23. And then of course, in addition to that, we, we work with, with AP staff across the world on, on various stories. Thanks, Peter. Claire, you're up. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Claire. I'm a freelance audio reporter and podcast producer currently living in Chicago, but um, I was acquainted with Cyline when I was the climate change environment reporter at Honolulu Civil Beat, um, where I hosted a podcast about science and environmental issues. Um, and, you know, had the unique challenge of making science really interesting to young people and for an audio based audience. So I'm really excited to answer any questions you have about working with local newsrooms or working with um, audio reporters or podcasters. Thanks, Claire and Lena. Hi, um, I'm Lena Sun with The Washington Post. I'm uh, one of about a dozen health and science reporters at The Washington Post. I have been covering the pandemic the last two plus years. Um, we also have a climate and science team that has broken off to be its own entity and its own department and will be staffing up um, as part of a trend. I think we'll have more than two dozen reporters um, by, the, by later this year. Um, the media landscape means that we are also writing for a generalist audience and try to um, not compete with all the bursts of incremental news, but to put things together in a way to help readers understand what is going on at this moment in the pandemic or what is happening with this disease. Um, and to think of our audience as maybe people, fifth graders, or perhaps even members of Congress for which you would be making your elevator pitch in about 15 seconds. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the scientists who have already helped us explain so many of these concepts during the pandemic, um, how much we appreciate the time they've taken to help us and happy to get your questions. Thanks, Lena. Thanks, Lena. Well, I wanna kick things off with a question for all three of you to get your perspectives. What do reporters, how do reporters choose what stories to cover? Peter, do you want to start on that one? Um, sure. I, I think it's uh, it, it's a it's a real back and forth between ideally with reporters and and editors. Um, the best stories, I really believe, come from reporters. Uh, you know, come from the ground up, and and the way that you know a reporter, the way that I would would find stories is talking to a lot of people. I mean, within your beat, right, um, or whatever it is you're you're working on, talking to a lot of people, reading widely. Um, you know, one of the things that brought me to this job is I, I covered a lot of environmental things over the years. And so talking to scientists, really making sure you're understanding what is happening um, and then and then seeing it as kind of a funnel, like this broad idea and then try to, you know, try to hone it and sharpen it um, and then take that, you know, to your editor, uh, try to, to pitch him or her on it and and then just kind of see see where it goes. Um, but I, but I think that's kind of the, the broad brush of the process for me. I think that um, for most of us, you know, the it's the news that would be driving what we decide to cover, right? And uh, for an ongoing story like the pandemic, we are constantly trying to figure out, okay, where where is the puck going next, and how can we anticipate the next um, the next the next development and be ahead of it and and put that in in a way that readers can understand. So there's news stories and then there are um, broader enterprise stories where you have an idea and you want to go deep down and spend a lot of time reporting on that issue. Obviously, the pandemic has has its own news cycle. Um, but for example, as part of that, I did a story about wastewater surveillance for COVID and that involved a lot of reporting that was all about this one issue, but talking to many different scientists and public health experts um, across the country. Most of my reporting has actually been driven by um, listener and reader questions. And so people who read the news outlets I work at will send me questions, will specifically ask for questions. What are you curious about? What do you not understand? What's impacting you? Um, but even as those questions come in, I, as a reporter, so I'll have to take those to my editor and ask if it's okay to do a story. And I think most newsrooms work that way, a reporter asking editor to go forward on a story. So once you figure out what story or stories you're gonna cover, what does a typical day look like for each of you? Is there such thing as a typical day? 
I don't think I don't think there's a typical day. Um, you know, like like Lena said, if it's sport, if it's a spot, you're you're trying to figure out where a story is going. You know, something breaks at you know ten in the morning, and and you're you're trying to cover that in that moment, but then also trying to anticipate like what else might happen and kind of think smartly about the reporting that you do. You know, along the way. Um, so yeah, I just there's there's uh, I've been doing this for 25 years and there's no typical day which which is part of the what makes it fun you know a typical day would be i mean in my my line of work it's if you're going to write a daily story or daily stories that day or a day where you are not writing something and i think you touched on this in the introduction our our days now are multiple deadlines it used to be i worked at the washington post i had one deadline it was in the evening and i had the entire day to work but now, if the CDC is coming out with some new guidance or there is some new report in a journal that is credible that we want to write about, then I have to work backwards if it, there's an embargo time to have the story ready when the embargo lifts. Or if it's a breaking news story and other people are already reporting it, then there is pressure for us to match it or confirm it. And then you are chasing that all day long. So good days are when there's not multiple stories like that where you can actually have time to think and develop ideas and and conduct interviews but um you know at the height of the pandemic that was that was much more difficult mm -hmm. claire how about for you is it is it different as a radio reporter or are you just or are your experiences similar to to what you've heard yeah, I think anytime you're working um, in, you know, either video or audio, um, you know, it takes longer to do everything. A lot of times I can't do interviews over the phone or even over Zoom because that audio just sounds terrible. It's so bad. Um, so I'm asking people to meet me in person. And um, I also really want to bring my listener to the scene where something is happening. So I often work with scientists who I interview them about some latest research. Um, like in their office and I say, okay, like, where can you take me? Where can you take me and the listener to understand what you do? Um, and so, you know, a lot of my days are like going tramping up fields. I've gone on multi-day camping trips with scientists trying to find endangered snails um, and trying to do really crazy out in the field stuff. So you collect really, really interesting scenes and audio so you can better explain to the listener what they're gonna learn about. Um, so some of my days are like that, really crazy on boats and traveling around. Um, then some days are just, you know, sitting, writing, um, editing the podcast. Um, then a lot of talking on phones. I always fact check, always following up with people afterwards. Is this right? Is this right? Is this right? So the only constant is I'm going to be talking to strangers. That's the only thing I know about my job every day. <laughs> Sounds pretty fun, actually. We do have a, a few questions coming in um, from, from attendees. Feel free to keep putting those in the chat. Uh, the first one I have is, how do you handle divergence of opinions from sources? Uh, for example, when two interview, interviewees are giving conflicting thoughts on a topic, how do you handle that as a reporter? Um, I think it depends on the subject. Um, I will just jump in here on uh, a subject for which the media has been criticized in the past, and I fully agree. Um, back in the day, early on, when there was a lot of anti-vaccine sentiment that was put forth by, um, this, this is decades ago, um, news reporters are always trained to like, okay, there's this side and there's this side, right? And well, I'm sorry, vaccines work, period, full stop. Um, the sky is, you know, the earth is not flat. I mean, the, and I think part of it is, for example, on the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there is a lot of stuff out there and it is really tricky to navigate and to try to separate what might be the motivating factors, how much of this is not science, how much of this is driven by um, political um, agendas. And you just try to do your best um, because if it's something that's really controversial, you're not just interviewing two people right, you might interview many people and you make the best judgment of, this seems to be the hypothesis that most credible folks believe, but there are some fringe folks who believe this, but at the same time, science is evolving, it's iterative. And for example, early on in the pandemic, 
nobody thought it was airborne transmission. And people who thought it was airborne transmission were, you know, not listened to and turns out to be airborne transmission. So you, you that this is where you have to do multiple interviews, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that it, it really just depends on the subject. Um, I mean, similar to you know, what you just said about, you know, vaccines working, like we're not going to entertain in, in climate stories, climate change deniers. I mean, the, the, the climate science is clear and you know, you you as a reader or, or whoever may have confusion about that, and I think we need to do a better job in the news media of of really explaining why you know partial degree increase matter and, and a lot of these things. But there, there we won't have a story that you know has both sides in in that in that realm. Where where you do want to host different opinions is like if you're talking about climate. Like what you do about it, you know what uh, what what are strategies to mitigate? Uh, what about adaptation? Um, and so that's an area where I think today there's a lot of divergence too. And and it's not just in the scientific community. This is something that pulls in, you know, all all different players, and politicians and innovators. And um, do you you know double down on green energy? Do you really try to push uh, changing the way cities are built? Uh, all of the above and many other things. So and in those cases, I think you want to really wrestle with and talk to a wide range of people and, and try to try to reflect those different views. We've got a, a couple more questions staying on the theme of, of sources. Um, one says in, in certain domains and certainly in the pandemic, there seem to be a subset of go-to experts or commentators. How do you think about developing a set of expert contacts while also capturing diverse voices and perspectives? That is an excellent question, and I'm glad you asked it. Um, sometimes when you are on deadline and you need somebody to give you the context who is not involved in the study um, in an hour or two hours, then you go to the people that you have a relationship with whom you trust, and they may be the folks that get quoted more. But I often try, I always ask when I'm talking to someone, and they usually, too often, they end up being white males who are the senior, senior authors. I always say, is there someone else that you can recommend who is a woman or somebody who is from a community of color at an institution that is not on the East Coast or the West Coast um, and, and you know, share their email and contact information? And then I try on the next story to reach out to that person. It, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because if the person is used to talking to you, then they can be fast, they respond immediately on deadline, they understand what you need. And if it's a completely new person, they will often have to go through their media relations at the university, which can take too long and don't get back to you on time. And then when they get back to you, they are too hesitant or don't want to, can't provide the kind of context that I need on deadline at that moment. So I try, and then there are these groups, um, you know, the 500 Women of Science, I, I go to the AAAS, um, I really try to find my, in my, my own personal hunt, I always try to quote more women because in this pandemic, too many of the guys are the ones who get quoted. It sounds like, it's important that people have some experience so they know how to work with reporters, but you've got to build that experience somehow. Clara, I'm curious how you think about diversity and the sources that you look for. Yeah, um, I'm similar. I try to keep things balanced. Certainly when I was in um, Hawaii, I was really trying to focus Native Hawaiian perspectives as well as local perspectives. Um, Hawaii is an incredibly unique place and you know, a researcher who moves there to study a certain thing had often had wildly different um, opinions on certain things and a local, someone who had born and raised in Hawaii. Um, and I also led the charge at my news outlet to start tracking our sources diversity, both um, race, where they're from, um, gender as well. And, you know, it, it was hard talking to some reporters in my newsroom when they say, yes, I know that I always go to this one person, but they're the one that gets back to me on deadline. It really came back to that time and time again. Um, and so, you know, if you are a PIO or, you know, you work on comms in a university, I think reaching out to reporters ahead of time and working to establish like 
hey, we have XYZ experts available. They know to look out for your email if you want to set up like an introductory call. Um, I think that would be very welcome. Not all reporters have the bandwidth to do that, but I did have someone from the University of Hawaii reach out to me say, hey, I noticed you're the new environmental reporter. Like, here's some people we have. You want to talk to them before you're on deadline? That was amazing. And I went to those people time and time again, and they also helped me connect with more experts. Um, so those are all things that I look for, certainly that help. That's great. I'm wondering when you're when you're not on deadline um, and you know, you're faced with potentially a, a new topic or something for which you don't have uh, a digital Rolodex of experts to whom to turn. Um, how do you decide who to reach out to? How do you search for uh, scientists for your story so that the scientists listening know how to be found? Yeah, I, I think when you do have time, this is something that really good reporters do and spend time like really trying to broaden like their contacts in general. And, and there are lots of ways to do that. I mean, one contact can lead you to another. That's maybe the best if, there, if there's somebody that you talk to quite a bit and you say, hey, is there, are there some other people in this field who you know, I, might, I might reach out to? Um, LinkedIn is a really good resource. A lot of, a lot of scientists um, are on LinkedIn. You know, of course, Twitter. Um, but I think it's no matter the, the method, if, if you spend some real time trying to figure out who some of these different scientists are in this case, you'll, you'll find them. Um, like for IPCC reports, both in February and, and you know, in early April, we made a real effort to, to make sure that we were speaking to scientists who were you know, from different countries and different backgrounds that that all would show up in in our different stories I and mean, we did lots of, of lots of different stories for the working group too at the at the end of february we did 11 stories from around the world one from each continent that joined the science with what was happening on the ground and and it was really important to me that 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 we have voices from people in those regions like man on the street but also you know scientists um, so it's something that you really have to keep working at right? but is really important for the coverage mm -hmm. I think that relying on someone who you trust who is credible in a certain field, then they know their adjacent experts. Um, and, uh, you know, like, okay, I'm not a immunologist, you know, but uh, you could try to reach out to so and so, so and so, and so and so. And then I would say, yes, but those are all guys. Give me the names of three women. <laughs> um, and then you, you know, you try to sort of build out that way. If it's a topic where you don't have any expertise, sometimes I go look in PubMed to see who has published on this. And if there's one name that comes up over and over again um, to try to reach out that way um, as you know, when you have time. I, this, the last two and a half years, there hasn't been that much time. I rely a lot on Google Scholar to find new people to talk to, especially for the series I was working on that was based on listener questions. Every day I'd be sitting down and one day I'm reporting on Zika, the next day I'm reporting on drinking water contamination. It could be totally random. Um, and it was really helpful when scientists easily had their contact information on their website. Um, I do spend a lot of time talking to university based researchers. And, you know, if there was a tab that was like media or news and the news link doesn't just send you to a bunch of press releases with no contact information on there. If there is a box somewhere that says, if you want to talk to one of our amazing experts, email or text or call this person, they're the one who needs to get the approval because that can happen a lot. Um, or if you, you know, for your own biography on your university page or with your researcher somewhere, if you say, if you're in the news media, if you're a reporter and you want to talk to me or someone on my team about my work, email here. You know, people are increasingly putting that online and it's the easiest way to just streamline the process and make sure that you're able to connect with someone who, who wants to talk to you more about your work. We've got a question here, I think, reflecting uh, some of what you all have said about the intensity of deadlines. It asks, how do you preserve the integrity of the profession, articulate nuance, and combat the market-driven pull toward dramatic headlines, all while you're on intense deadlines? That is really hard because on stories that have great reader interest, um, you know, any major development on the COVID vaccines, the way the sausage is made at the Washington Post is 
We want to be the first one out there with the story, with an alert and a headline and a blurb, all of it written while I am still reporting the story. Um, I can try to do enough generally, but I don't know what the vote will be or I don't know what they're gonna decide. And so it, um, the more information that scientists or experts can provide ahead of time, even if it's embargoed, the better is the, the better information, the more accurate the information will be that we have to work with because we are on these intense deadlines. And sometimes these alerts are required to be written literally, and then they go back and forth on wording and headline chains. And the people who are writing these headlines for the alerts are not the reporter and the editor. It's a completely different team of people. So it is really, really tough. And at the same time, the competitive pressure on every individual news organization is very high because you are trying to provide the news to break through the all the noise of all the news out there, but in an accurate way. And um, I'm I, all I can tell you that it is it is a struggle, and we really try very hard to walk that fine line. Mm -hmm. I, I I see it as. Um... A story is is like a changing thing. It's like a it's a ball of clay, and you start with it, and and as you go, you keep refining it, and and that's I think one way that that you can kind of balance all of that. At the AP, we our mantra is like file every five um, or sooner than that if you can every five minutes. So you know if if all you can put out on a story and be responsible and feel good about it is two sentences. That's fine. And then five minutes within five minutes, what else can you do? And maybe you can't. But I, I think where you run into trouble is, is is trying to go too far when you don't know enough. Um, and so if you see a story as just something, and, and this is a wire service thing particularly, but I think Washington Post, New York Times, like you you all are, are reporting in very similar ways, putting out what you know as you know, and then just keep building. Um, I think you can avoid a lot of those pitfalls. Another question about, I think, your roles as reporters in the story um, asks, when you are particularly passionate about an issue, how do you keep your own perspectives out of your work? Is separating your views and your personal activities from your professional work taxing? Claire, I'm curious for you. I know you've done a lot of environmental reporting. Um, your reflections on this idea. Yeah, um, I certainly don't find it taxing because I want people to know that they can trust me and trust that, you know, any, because, you know, as a reporter doing, you know, once it's a podcast, so it's my face and name on it and people would write in with questions. So I was often put in a position where I felt like I was having to give advice or respond um, to people's particular situations. Um, but I wanted people to know that they could trust me that what I was telling them was going to be accurate. It wasn't coming from any, you know, political platform or it wasn't coming from any agenda that was going to benefit me. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that maybe some people who get into the news media find that taxing to hold back their opinions um, as a science reporter, as long as I knew what I was saying was backed up by the latest science, peer reviewed science, um, I felt comfortable going forward, but that's not the view that every reporter necessarily has in this current ecosystem. Um, well, I'll, I'll say just just a few things about that. I, I agree with Claire. It's 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 not taxing because if you really think about your role, it's it's not to, um, to to share your opinions. It's just not. I mean, everybody has opinions, of course, and they have a place, but not publicly. Um, and and I think particularly in this environment, there uh, there are many different thoughts on this. I mean, particularly. Uh, People who cover, um, you know, marginalized communities um, say, "Well, you know, if if I support Black Lives Matter, I should be able to put, you know, that on my on my Twitter." And that's an ongoing discussion. From my view, when you when you share those kind of things, you you invite people to really question you and and question, you know, your authenticity or or question, you know, your objectivity or your fairness. Um, so it, it, it can be tough because we all have opinions about things, but I think, I think it just, it's better for your work if you keep those to yourself, you know, or with your family or whatever, not in public forums. 
I mean, we have very strict rules and I always think twice about what I'm going to post on Twitter. I may have a very passionate feeling about some baked good I just made or <laughs> something, something in, you know, outside of work. But yeah. if it's for sharing stories and if I'm sharing um, perspectives or opinion pieces that have written by my colleagues, I make clear that I'm sharing that as an opinion or a perspective piece, um, not because, you know, to for the information that it provides. I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, a question we often get at Sciline from scientists is can scientists see or fact check stories before they're published? Um, and a corollary to that, what can they do if they see a factual error in a published story that they might have talked to a reporter about? Um, so I'll just jump in on that one quickly. Um, no, as a policy scientist, no, you know, we don't share drafts of stories ahead of time. That's just standard policy. Actually, if you do that, you can get fired. Um, but it all depends on who you are interviewing. If I'm interviewing someone about a really complicated subject and I am paraphrasing what I think they're saying and I'm writing it in the story, I wanna make sure that my paraphrase for the general audience is accurate. So I will often read it back or email it back and say, hey, you said this, this is how I'm interpreting, is that correct? And there might be a back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and once something is published, since everything is now published online first, and in most places, people wanna have their stories published in the morning to get the eyeballs, we certainly do. Um, somebody sees something and it's not correct, the first thing they should do, they sh there's a, probably a widget where you can send an email or contact the reporter uh, or the news organization, hey, you got that wrong, that was not right. And online, we can make those corrections right away and then those corrections will appear on the story. Yeah, no, I, I second pretty much everything, everything she said there. We, we as a policy, won't show share drafts. And, and when we're offered sometimes exclusives, um, and this isn't so much necessary in science, although some, and people want to review what it is we're going to do before, then the answer is no, then we, we're not, we won't accept, you know, we won't, we won't do it. Um, and if you see any error, please reach out because the way our cycles work is a story, you know, a story goes from whenever it starts to midnight Eastern time, and then that cycle starts over. So if there's a story, at, you know, that moves at 10 a.m., and you know, you're quoted in it and you see an error or something, or you feel like you're misquoted or whatever it is, if you reach out to the reporter and the editor, there's time to fix it like within our cycle, right? If, if it's two days later, I can't fix what's live, what's out there in the world. And, and then the question is, do I need to do a correction? Is this you know, really egregious? Is there something wrong here? Or, or is this a time where, where we say to the source, you know, look, I'm sorry, we got this piece of this, you know, a little bit off. If, if you reach out immediately, we have, we have a chance to address in real time, you know, the issue. The one difference I would make is if I'm reporting a story and I'm talking to someone who has never really been interviewed by a reporter before, um, and here I'm not talking about scientists, but I'm talking about more or other folks, and it's a long story, and let's say it's very personal, and people are spending a lot of their time sharing um, uh, very emotional things with me, and they're a part of a larger mosaic. I will call them back and say, here's where you fit in the story. Your, your story is going to be in the middle or the end, or and I'm only going to focus on you know, what happened to the baby here, but not there. I will sort of walk them through, but I never share the actual draft of the story. I, I work with a lot of scientists who sometimes find this hard to wrap their mind around because, um, you know, when you're talking about scientific articles or publications, you know, that's a that's a core part is having everyone involved go back and peer review it in a way. Um, something I tend to tell the scientists I work with is, you know, if a politician, if I'm writing a story about the governor and he said, I'm only going to talk to you if I get to review it ahead of time, you can see where that could um, cause some issues. And as journalists, we have to treat a lot of sources the same way. Um, but I think what Lena mentioned, what I'm very willing to do is before something publishes, before the podcast goes up, I'm happy to call you and talk about what we talked about, what my takeaways are, and just have that extra 
fact checking. Um, at every outlet I work with, we do something called bulletproofing, which is we make sure everything is totally up to snuff before we hit publish. If you're working in breaking news, you can't do that. Podcasts have the luxury of a longer deadline. Um, so, you know, before you talk to a journalist, before you agree to go on the record, you can have that conversation with them about what is this going to look like? What's the process for fact checking? Who do I contact if I have a problem? Can we talk ahead of time? And I think most reporters are really, really open to, you know, having that conversation before you even have the actual interview. There's a great question about um, how you cover research papers. Particularly, how do you grapple with the growth of articles being posted on preprint servers where the content is not yet peer reviewed? We've seen this come up a lot in, in COVID, but it was happening before then. Um, how do you, any of you, handle preprints? We use, we look at a lot of the preprints, and really during the pandemic, so much information was coming out on the preprints that you, you, you sort of needed to know. Um, I can't recall any single story that we did that was just based on a preprint. Um, we often use the material that's on the preprint as part of the context, but we will make it clear according to an article that was not peer reviewed. Um, you know, we, we try to be as transparent as possible. Um, but I think with, with, the, with the amount of science and the amount of, of um, data that is being published, you, you cannot not look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar. We, we, our, our inclination is not to publish, not to, to do too much with preprint, but, but particularly with COVID, I mean, there's just, there's so much coming and it's so fast that I think you have to at least grapple with it, um, but then make clear that, you know, it's not peer reviewed, it's not, you know, it's not final published, that, that this is kind of a work in progress. If scientists have a good story idea, how can they most effectively pitch that idea to you? Claire, I know you said you did a lot of reporting responding to uh, viewer listener questions and, and things that came in, um, but I'm wondering for all three of you, how, how, do, how do the best pitches work? Um, when scientists email me, I would often, you know, say, okay, congratulations on getting this published, but how does this actually impact someone? And if you're going to cold email a journalist, really focusing on who is this impacting or what is this impacting? And um, I really appreciate all of yours, you know, unique scientific expertise, but saying, oh, there's this like one tiny fungi in like the rural valley of Kauai, like, okay, that might not necessarily pique the interest of a larger audience. So if we can spread it out and talk about how people are going to be impacted or how people's lives are going to change or be impacted by your research, really highlighting that up top is um, a pretty surefire way to make sure that your pitch gets some eyes on it. I think that, you know, remember that we are not um, scientific journals. So I am sorry to say that I am not interested in phase one, phase two, phase three of whatever clinical trial. You have just made a great scientific discovery. Unless you have figured out a way to cure long COVID or you have just, you know, something really, really big, we are probably not going to write about it. And I use this, you know, think about if you're at a dinner party and you, and you are trying to explain something cool to this person at the dinner party and it would really be interesting to them, then that could be a, a threshold for whether it would be interesting to us. And, it, and most of all, you have to answer the question, why? And how, as like Cleric said, how does this make the world a better place? Or do we learn more about um, uh, black holes? Or, um, you know, if something you've, just, just discovered works in the lab, um, then I'm not as interested as if something is the first real world evidence of this vaccine being even more effective than the previous one. Um, so it really comes down to, I think the best way is if you had to make a pitch for money and you only had 15 seconds with that member of Congress who often is not educated about anything, how would you explain it in those kinds of terms? Yeah, for me, a lot of times in, in those pitches, because I get I get a lot, not, not just you know, from scientific journals and stuff, but but also from companies and net zero this and you know, net zero that, 
is is w why it matters. I think you know what what's the overall significance um, to a, to a larger you know population. Um, so or or as different editors I've had along the way have told me like who cares you know and and you've got to be able to answer that pretty quickly like why why something matters and where it fits in the larger scheme of things. If you're studying a particular thing and and you find out some some piece. Like where does that fit in in you know the, the larger tape? Lena, I wanted to follow up with you on on one thing because I know that COVID has been a huge part of your life for your reporting life for two plus years. But how can scientists break into the news cycle with non-COVID research discoveries these days? How how can they find room to get in there with great ideas um, that are not related to COVID? I will talk to you about the story that my colleague Joel Achenbach did about that far distant planet um, um, that they saw on the Hubble telescope. It was um, something that was major news and he wanted to make sure that we covered it. And just to give you an example of how he didn't write it in the sort of typical scientific way, just bear with me, I will read you the lead of that story perfect for today. I think it's a Star Wars anniversary. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there was a large and magnificently brilliant star that shined across the young expanding universe. The starlight skewed blue. It was the cosmic morning when everything in the universe was still new, raw, the galaxies still forming not long after the first stars had ignited and lit up the heavens. And that was for a story in a report published Wednesday in the journal Nature, a team of astronomers asserts that this is the most distant individual star ever seen. And that story wrote itself onto the front page because it was a creative way and he understood the impact, the, the import of it. Now, not everybody gets that, um, but you can send in pitches and to think of the most like what is the strongest, most creative, most interesting thing about this scientific discovery or this piece of research um, and see if it will break through the noise. I'm sorry, that doesn't help too much, but part of it would mean do not use jargon um, and really explain in simple sentences that you can repeat at a dinner party, that a fifth, that you, just because something is complex, doesn't mean your explanation has to be complex. You should be able to explain it to a fifth grader. Sorry. Sure. Lena, your, your example warms my, my little astronomy heart. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, Peter, I had a question for you that's a little bit more about, about a different types of roles in the newsroom because your title is news director. How is that different from being a reporter or different from being an editor? So yeah, so a, new, a news director at the AP means that you are the editor and editorial lead of, of all formats. Um, traditionally at, at the AP, this was kind of siloed off. There'd be you know uh, a photo editor and, and text editor, and video is is not that old at the AP. You know, just a few decades, but you know there was there was uh, video editors. The way a news structure works with news director is that the, this person is in charge of of all the formats, uh, the budgets, the overall editorial thrust, um, not necessarily doing that work. I mean, I'm only one person. Um, and then within that, we all have our strengths. Um, so that, that's how that works for us. And then we have within that different editors who are special specialists, you know, an editor for, for photos, we have editors for presentation, we have video editors, we have, of course, text editors. Um, we, we also have editors who work on like promotion um, on, on what's called our nerve center. Um, and then, and then sort of further down, like the hierarchy, I mean, you have individual journalists who, who are reporters, you know, who, who write, who take photos, who take video, who shoot video. Um, one, one thing that's really emerged, I think in the last 20 years, particularly is like this idea of like hybrid journalists who work in like more than one format. We have, we have a lot of those who, you know, photographers who also do video or, I mean, it just depends or text reporters who also do photography. Um, so that's kind of our big picture operating. Thanks. And, and Claire, 
because you work specifically in radio, um, I wonder if there are any unique needs that a radio reporter or a podcast reporter such as yourself has that scientists should keep in mind if they're thinking about different formats um, for, for news that they might want to become involved in. Definitely. Um, something that I got very um, adept at during the pandemic was asking people to record themselves, which is, um, you know, instead of going into the radio station or me meeting them with a the microphone or them going into their university's radio station, you know, using the voice memos app on their phone to record the interview, I would talk to them over Zoom um, and then they would send me the audio. Um, that is super duper helpful because, you know, I can't put your voice on the radio or in a podcast if I cannot understand what you're saying. Um, so that's been really helpful. And um, I think, you know, also what Peter and Lena have saying, talk, you know, drop the jargon. This, you're not presenting at a conference. Um, please do not use acronyms. Um, you know, that just takes extra time to explain what are these acronyms are. You know, pretend like you're explaining something to a fifth grade class um, and then all step in and provide some context as well in the story, but just talk like a, a human person like you are talking to your friends. Um, it can be really hard to get your mind out of that, but especially when you're in audio format when you know the listener only hears your quote once they can't go back and reread it multiple times like in a print article. Um, it's really important to speak clearly. Um, and then something I touched on earlier, you know, just me and a scientist sitting in their office having a conversation is not going to be as interesting to a listener as, you know, going out in the field, we're going to the ocean where, you know, we're finding these dead whales, we're going through the woods to find the endangered snail, like that is much more engaging and really helps people care about what you're doing because they get transported to that scene. Um, so whenever possible, you know, bring a reporter along, why not? <laughs> That sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, there's a question in the chat that 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 Lena uh, answered a little bit, but I wanted to bring up um, for everybody to hear. Uh, some people have worked with a trusted reporter on a story that they felt was balanced, but the outlet then published the story with a sensational headline that didn't actually reflect the story. How can you, as a source, guard against this? Tell us about headlines. Headlines are really tough because think of your phone and you're scrolling through stories and some stories you will stop and read. And the purpose of the headline is to make you stop and click on that story. So it cannot be a really long headline. There are many, you know, many places have limits for how many characters can be in a headline. I think we, we ours is now 70, but I think the APs is even shorter. So when you have only a certain amount of space, you 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 just condensing and you're summarizing and you're you're constantly trying to find a way for people to for it to get your attention, but to be accurate. And that is that is a constant struggle. If you write, here is another report that tells you a little bit more about this subject, nobody is going to click on it, no matter how important it is. I mean, of course, I just made that up, but but it is, it, is, it is tricky and the best headlines are ones where many of us spend time workshopping the headline. What's the best word? What is the most accurate way to reflect the tone? And um, it is hard because so much of what we do is also, um, you know, if your story gets a lot of hits, then more people will have seen it. And so you want people to read your story. You want to when they get into the story. Well, I, I'd, I'd add to that um, that at, at AP, we're, we're a little unique in that we put content out to other businesses, right? We're a B2B, I mean, we're, we're also, a, you know, B2C to, to direct to, con to consumers. But sometimes you can have all the conversations that you want in your own newsroom. And what you put out to the world is one thing, but then when editors look at it from different newspapers, I mean, they can and sometimes do make changes, you know, to headlines um, to fit their their newspaper to fit their needs. Um, those are, you know, harder to to fight against, um, particularly because you don't know necessarily when it's happening. But at least, like from the AP story, it goes back to something we talked about earlier. Like if you see something that does not feel right or you object to, 
I mean, let us know as, as soon as possible because we can fix it. Um, I mean, we put a lot of care into headlines before something gets published. Like Lena said, thinking, is this the right word? Are we really accurately you know, talking about what's in this story? But the other side of that is trying to make something interesting. And, and this happens a lot, you know, particularly with climate stories. And, and I have you know, our audience folks sometimes reach out to me and say, you know, this story is really good, but it's not doing very well. Can we change the headline? And, you know, they'll come up with something and we'll go back and forth. And um, so it, it's a it's a process. But but you all should be part of that if you see something that doesn't seem right. We're nearly at the end of our session. So I wanted to give each of the speakers just a minute to close uh, with one final question that I have for each of them. What is one piece of advice or a take home message that you have for scientists who want to engage with the media? Peter, do you wanna kick us off on that one? Um, yeah, my, my piece of advice, and this is something we've talked about, but I think it's so important is, is to really in the way that you present your work, just like Lena said, you're at that, you're at that dinner party, you know, how, how you talk about that is, is just so important to, to drop the jargon to, to really try to talk in plain terms that will get journalists attention that will help us tell the public why stuff matters. I mean, when you think about climate, climate change, there, there are still people out there who confuse it with, you know, holes in the ozone. And I mean, you just, you hear all kinds of things. So that tells me that all of us have to do a better job of, of really explaining these things, but in, in really simple terms. Thanks. Claire? Uh, connect with local reporters in your area. If you oversee students, people who are publishing dissertations, you know, find a reporter to connect them to so that the next generation of scientists coming up after you have more media experience early on. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to reporters, reach out to editors, news directors and say, hey, I usually cover X, you know, research XYZ, you know, please give me a call when these subjects come up, make yourself available. Um, and, you know, help other people get access to media to highlight their great work that they're doing. Thanks. And Lena? I think that it's important to, um, in addition to everything I've said before about like at the dinner party, if you're talking about abstract concepts and you are used to talking about large numbers or things, put it in a different way. If it's a large number, instead of saying, oh, like hundreds or a hundred thousands, like, how many of these, imagine this would fit how many people in a stadium, in a football stadium, or it would be as if, you know, you laid this, you know, end to end around the earth. I mean, use social math. You can use photos, you can use graphics um, to a chart to show um, increase in a certain virus level. Um, you know, the bottom line is, if the story has to be interesting enough for you to tell it to another person, then you probably hit a threshold. Um, and you, if you're inside your own little bubble circle and it's incremental, then we, you know, if it's not a specific scientific journal, I am not going to be interested. And I think it's naive to think that somebody out there who's a junior faculty member has an idea for a story, will know how to um, reach a reporter. Um, I think that they could, um, like what Claire said, you know, be bold. Um, if your research is in the Boston area, find a Boston reporter, right? If you're in some other place, start there. And finally, for the media relation folks on this call, um, do not send us pitches for just random stuff. Go do the Google search. And if Claire is writing about a particular frog, then if you have that frog expert or that amphibious expert, send it to them, but don't just blanket the, the media with like, okay, I have this many experts. I'll just randomly send you stuff because you know what? I will just delete it. It has to be, you know, do the search, see what the person's interested in doing, see what the person's been writing about. So that's my pitch. <laughs> Thank you to all three of you uh, for such incredible advice throughout the hour. Thank you to everyone watching. Your questions were great, and we really appreciate your interest in learning about working with the media. Um, please feel free to follow my organization, Sciline, on social media at Real Sciline, and check out all of the free resources we offer on our website to connect you with reporters. You can find us at Sciline.org. 
Thank you again to our speakers, to be you, and I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your afternoon. Bye.